Hi everyone, welcome to Chart's uh, webinar. Uh, today we have Jim Knight with Interviewing That Rocks. Jim Knight is a 30-year veteran in training and development and a longtime chart member. He spent six years as a middle school teacher and 21 years at Hard Rock running training and development for the brand before going off on his own to become a speaker, author, and consultant. Jim's webinar is called Interviewing That Rocks and it focuses on developing confidence and consistency in the critical managerial skills of inter interviewing potential hires. I'd like you all to know you are all on mute right now and will be throughout the, the webinar, but there is a question mark on the side of your um, screen, which you can click on and send in questions throughout the uh, presentation. Most will probably be addressed at the very end. Um, welcome, Jim. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, so out of the uh, the keynote topics that I'm actually lucky enough to do, this is traditionally not one of them, honestly. It's uh, flat out a technical managerial skill that is really more geared toward a workshop or in this case a webinar but you know wow is it important in our industry so that's that's kind of where I'm gonna start you know I just wanted to throw out this uh, th this first question as to why we would even want to spend time on this you know what what's the big deal uh, about this and I guess the biggest thing is anytime that I talk to a leader of any organization talent and finding the right ones and also holding on to them but we're gonna talk about interviewing today it's like the biggest thing that they worry about more than anything else and in my experience I've noticed that experienced managers especially those in our industry are notorious for thinking that they in fact are pretty good at interviewing when most of them probably are not if you've ever sat through particularly people that are let's say in operations and I came from operations but if this isn't what they normally do it's not a professional skill that they have learned it's a little bit of an issue and it's scary if you sit there and listen and watch the way that they conduct an interview and and I would say even you know experienced training and development people experts that are in the industry traditionally don't get great training themselves when it comes to this particular topic so I uh, not really we, we see a huge amount of staff level turnover that happens in the first 90 days of employment and, and if I was doing a work ask people why you think this is but the reality is when you start to really dive down you'll discover that it's because we made a bad hire we did not do a very good job in the way we actually interviewed the employee or the potential employee and unfortunately we hired people and you know 60 90 days later we go oh my gosh we, we, we made a wrong decision and unfortunately we have to take out a lot of those those people my, my sort of thought is if we do this on the front end if we interview poorly we're gonna get a bad hire that's gonna turn to, to turnover they're going to leave which is the root of all evil I think at least in our industry and that's gonna lead to to low sales and, and there's no doubt in my mind and I've seen this direct correlation between high turnover and low sales you know the the year-on-year -year sort of comp store sales I used to see this all the time on my past you know you you'd go and look at the top restaurant at the top cafes in comp sales they happen to be the ones with the lowest turnover so I know that the analogy for me is all about if we get the right person on the bus if we make sure that we hire the right one we're we're absolutely going to ultimately provide great return on investment so hiring the right person too important for us to mess up. I believe that we've got to focus on getting the right ones on board and so I look at what I call 3C employees. We want to make sure that we've got people that have the right competence. You know, they, they can actually do the gig. We want people that have strong character. You know, they're not um, trying to disrupt the harmony of what we're trying to do. They're, they're not looking for an opportunity to steal from us. They're not just putting in the, the bare minimum amount. You know, they, they know the value orientation of the business and now you know I talk about this quite a bit there's something to be said about having a right fit from a cultural standpoint really good brands great organizations they now know that experience work experience and coming to the table with that is not enough anymore so the old adage that we've all heard particularly if you're in the HR training and development world on the on the webinar this old adage of uh, hire for attitude train for skill you know that that's not new at all but it is more relevant today I, I think than ever before so my question maybe first before we jump into the details of interviewing who do you think is more prepared do you think it's the uh, the applicant or do you think it's the actual manager and some people might be thinking it's the manager but it is no doubt the applicant think about it you know they, they've cleared their schedule they, they've done probably a little bit of work on studying the brand they jumped online or maybe they they've been there before as a guest 
you know, they know the type of questions that are coming because these are the same ones that you usually get at least in a first interview. You know, they, they have literally thought about this particular job and, and leading up to the interview. So they put a lot of energy and time into it. Managers, we're busy as all get out. We're working shifts. You know, we've got our mind on other things. We, we have a ton of applicants, you know, and other interviews that we have to deal with. You know, we basically don't even have time in a lot of cases to even review the applicant or, or even the, uh, the application before the person arrives. So it is no doubt the applicant, which tells me that we've just got to get a little bit better at getting ourselves a little bit more organized and prepared. So here's a statistic. This is something that Hard Rock talks about, and, and we've done this in some e-learning courses before and, and some instructor-led courses, that if we do our jobs right, and I think most of you know this, you're going to hire a very small percentage out of the actual amount of interviews, 10, maybe 20%, the majority of which are not going to get the gig. So in mind, we've got to consistently hire what we call rock stars, and, and the only way you're going to be able to do that, particularly if you've got a huge organization, if you've got more than one or two locations, you're going to have to implement some non-negotiable interviewing standards. And, and I guess this is the difference between a best practice and a standard. You know, a best practice, great ideas, they've got uh, proven successes, but you get to choose to do it or not. But when you get to a standard, which is a non-negotiable, you have to do it. You must do it. It's got to be part of the approved company process. So for me, interviewing should be one of those black and white policies that ensures consistency. So I'm going to throw a couple of these standards out to you. And the very first one I would say is we have got to use some approved interviewing collateral. So what would those be? So I'm going to throw this question out to you again just to think about it. What, what should be the three things that you should bring to every interview? And some of these may be obvious to you, but others may be a little bit new, at least from a, from a process standpoint. This one no doubt seems pr pretty easy, right? You're going to make sure you have the person's application. How about bringing the job description? Maybe not something that you thought about bringing at least the app to the uh, to, to the interview because maybe you thought they've already read this before they actually got there. But you ought to bring one. I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. But the last one, which doesn't happen very often, this is part of the non-negotiable I'm talking about. You want to make sure that you bring interview guides to the party. Make sure that you bring all three of these, application, job description, and an interview guide. I'm going to talk about a couple of these. I'll start with the application at the very least, and I'm assuming most people know this, you know, but, but the goal is to both protect the brand, I think, from risk, but also to save managers time. And, and one of these is, you know, at least in this country, you can't write on it. Don't staple anything to it. Don't write anything on it, which means if you're going to take notes, you can do that on the side, but that, that's really why you're going to have the interview guide, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Some quick things about the application, though. I, I use this language, and I've done this with many other organizations. You need to be able to visually scan the application for what we call red flags. So what would a red flag be? It would be anything, and I'm just going to populate all these on here really quickly for you. Anything that would maybe jump out off the application, that would be an issue for you that you probably need to address in, in the interview at some point. And I would say that you should be able to read through this entire application within about 30 to 60 seconds. 30 seconds is, is, is probably best. You should be able to look at both sides, bop, bop, get in, get out. And these things should, should, should be like the alien, you know, jumping off and onto your face right off of the page to say, uh-oh, I need to address the fact that they only want to work weekends. Or, you know, the fact that there's a gap in an employment, you know, that's maybe been a year or longer or, or whatever it is. Visually scan through that because, again, I'm just being very realistic that everybody on this call are super busy, particularly operators. They don't have a lot of time to spend four or five minutes diving deep dive into the application when this is probably more of a screening than anything else. 30, 60 seconds, get in, get out. So that would be the focus on those three pieces of collateral. I'd bring it to every single interview. The next non-negotiable, I'd put in some multiple interviewings. You know, whatever these look like. I would have a multiple interview process for every single hire. It doesn't matter if they're bussers, dishwashers, bartenders, servers. Some people might be in the hotel world. You know, if you're front desk agents or spa attendants, doesn't matter. Everybody goes through a multiple process. And every one of those should be done by a different managers and only managers. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But here's what a multiple interview process could look like. 
You know, the first one could be any manager. Doesn't matter to me. Shouldn't matter to you. If you want it to be the department manager, that that's cool. But then the next interview is going to be somebody else other than the department manager or the first person. Now that first interview, again, is more of an application screening, probably asking some very technical and behavioral questions. Of course, you're asking open-ended questions. Again, this may sound very simple to the HR people, you know, on the webinar, but you know, open-ended is certainly the way to go. These are obviously questions that require an answer other than a uh, than, than a yes or a no. Um, and, and here's the big kicker: this might shock a, a lot of people on the call. Averaging about seven to ten minutes for that first interview. Every single person, every single time, about seven to ten minutes. Even if you're not going to hire them. I would I would absolutely put in as a process spend about seven minutes and I'll talk about that in just a moment the next interview could be any other manager again so if you wanted to make the department manager the first interview then you need to pick a different manager on the second and vice versa doesn't matter to me me you know if I had my druthers I, I'd probably pick any manager to just use the screening they should be great at that Second, hand it off to the department manager. These questions are probably a little bit more deeper. They're a little bit more specific to the job. You know, a few cultural questions in there, and you're probably going to spend a little bit more time, about 15 to 20 minutes. And then, obviously, the last one would be the, the person who has the highest amount of impact and influence. They're the ones who are running the show. In a restaurant, it's probably the general manager. I would insist that the GM, he or she, is involved in every single interview process, but they're the last one, not the first one. Because if you put that GM at the front, they're going to influence the rest of the managers. So if they like them, it, it'll definitely start to make everybody else go, oh, the GM likes it. You know, if he or she is, is all on board and they're giving me the thumbs up, why wouldn't I want to hire them? In, in a hotel environment, it's probably human resources that are involved. You, you probably have way more staff. You might not have the GM that can that can be involved in it. Where this person can, I would try and, and push it, but human resources who are going to you know, basically be experts in interviewing anyway, and of course these can be a combination of the previous two interviews and then maybe a few other broader questions if you want to. Um, timeline, totally up to you. I, I'm not so wrapped up on it, but I, I would definitely say have the top person or the HR folks be the last interview. Different perspectives are going to get you to the person that you want. You want to hire rock stars, you need different perspectives. If you have one person, even if they're an experienced manager, and, and this is my problem, you know, no matter how experienced a man or ma manager may be in interviewing, th they should probably have different perspectives to make sure that you're not hiring just solely in his or her image. And again, having the top person last is going to help out. Well, one thing I mentioned um, earlier when I got to this slide is you know, it, it, I would probably not have staff members involved in the interviewing process. You know, I think you've got some potential risk if they're not trained or they're not saying the right things. All it takes for somebody to say one question that you're not supposed to where it could be discriminatory or all of a sudden you open yourself up for a lawsuit. I know there are some people on the webinar that will insist on doing hiring committees or having staff members be a part of it, and I can address that at the very end, but I would not have them a part of the traditional the traditional interviewing process. I would make that all managers who hopefully are doing the type of training that we're talking about here on, on the webinar. Last big, huge monster standard for me, we've kind of already talked about this. If you're going to have multiple managers involved in the interview, then each of them need to have a different guide composed of completely different questions. You do not want to waste your time asking the exact same questions. So I'm going to put these interview guides up here. Um, again, no matter how experienced a manager might be in interview, everybody should be using an interview guide. If for no other reason, it's because of the main point that I'm going to make at the very end. But, but at the very least, you don't want to waste anybody's time, is especially the managers. So when I'm looking at this information, the questions are going to be exactly what I mentioned before. They're still open-ended. They require something other than yes or no, so that's going to force, obviously, the applicant to talk a little bit. They're going to be behavioral-based. They're going to be technical or, or I say, job-specific, particularly when you get, let's say, to the department manager. And then you can even throw in some cultural questions. But out of anything else, I would say that this bullet point right here is the main reason why. 
if you don't have some sort of a communication logbook, you know you're not allowed to write on the application. Well, then the interview guide could be the official format. It's the way, the conduit that all of the managers are going to communicate between each other. So if I was personally a manager doing interview number one, when I have this whole thing filled out, I can stick this piece of paper somewhere, put it in a manager's box, so that the next manager is able to look at that and refer to it. And even the general manager or, or HR in the hotel world, uh, either one of them, could pick all of these interview guides up and get a pretty good, clear indication of what's come before use these as the tool to actually write on. And by the way, even if you're an experienced manager and you think, oh, I don't really need that, I'm fairly good at it, I've been doing this for 30 years, you know, it doesn't hurt to have this piece of paper that you can jot things down. I would even say that up front. Let, let the applicant know. Hey, by the way, I'm just going to jot down a few notes here uh, just so I don't miss anything. Is that cool with you? You know, just letting people know so you're not, you know, no, nobody likes having to write things down or feel like they've got to use a tool or a crutch. But honestly, it doesn't matter how great we are. Think of it as the communication tool. And by the way, it'll help you hire the right ones because you're not going to miss anything and just sort of be grasping at straws if this isn't part of your normal sort of feng shui. All right, so I'm going to spend the majority of the time talking about interview guide number one. Now, this is just a sample that you see on the screen. I don't expect you can read all of this. Um, th this is probably the one I always focus on since, you know, 80% of the applicants aren't even going to make it to the next level. So I, would, I just want to get really, really great at this. And, and I'm going to go into each one of these, but it is broken down, at least in the first interview, into all four elements of an interview. Now I'm going to put all these up there. Opening, the information gathering, information giving, and closing. Not only was I able to help be a part of this process and developing and thinking in these terms of chunking down the interview when I was at Hard Rock, I certainly have done this with many other organizations in my consulting business. This will help people guide their way so they don't get lost in the interview. They, they get lost in sometimes all of the specific interview questions, but you forget how important the opening and the closing and even selling the brand a little bit. So if you can think of these terms, open, Information gathering, information giving, and closing, it'll help you keep your wits and keep very, very specific about the interview itself. So let me go into the first one. I've got the, uh, the four elements up here in the right-hand corner just so that you can keep a tab of it. But we'll start with opening. This, by far, is going to be the shortest amount of time that you're going to spend. You know, it, it won't be a lot, but it sets the tone for the interview. We definitely want you to introduce yourself, and that would be your name and title. Now, when I, I'm, you know, I'm not so focused on giving out titles, I, I try and avoid that at all costs. I think this is one of the times you need to let somebody know that you're a manager or if you're teaching this for people on the webinar, you're teaching this to people in operations, let people know if they're the, uh, you know, hey, I'm the bar manager or I'm the general manager or I'm the receiving manager or whatever it is, depending on how big your organization is. But definitely introduce yourself. Then you've got these others uh, that, that are just really, they, they take seconds to help build a relationship. And I'm not saying ask all of them, but I'm saying you should definitely pick out a couple that make sense. Here's a couple in quotation marks. Again, these are just samples. You can pick and choose whatever works for you. Hey, would you like something to drink? Is it still hot out there? Is it still cold? You know, is it raining outside or whatever the case may be? Did you find your way to the property okay? And you know, insert your, your word here. Did you find your way to the location, the venue, the restaurant, whatever it is? You know, have you been here before? That, that actually says a lot about the applicant. Have they actually been in there as a, as a guest? You know, again, if you wanted to rattle off and try and name all four of these and build that relationship, go for it. You know, even if you did that, that's only going to take a few seconds and a little bit of response. It allows people to just breathe a little bit and relax, and it just puts them in a much better state than, boom, starting to jump in with some interviewing questions. But then you very quickly, as part of the opening, need to get to this. You need to ask about the job description. So I mentioned before, this is one of those things you want to bring with you because of this. If you ask them, have you had a chance to read over the job description, and they say no, that's what you do. You can easily just turn around, slide it across the table, and have them read it. And, and in some cases, some of you have them actually sign off on it because the next question is, are you able to perform the duties listed? So somewhere right up front, like something to drink? Is it hot out there? Did you make it here? Hey, have you had a chance to read over the job description? You have? Cool. Are you able to perform the duties listed? If you don't ask that question up front and they have not read it, you're wasting your time the rest of the interview. They need to make sure that they can actually do the job. That piece of paper, or in some places it might be a packet, 
you keep all of the department job descriptions one place, that's perfect. Just make sure that you bring that thing with you. Next area, information gathering. All right, now where, where the opening was kind of short, this one's where you're going to spend the most amount of time. And it's going to be the point where you decide whether you're going to hire the person or not. The first thing I would say is, you know, applicants should be the one that's doing the most talking. If you find that you're doing the most talking as a manager, it's not an interview. You know, it's a sales job, and, and you're trying to convince the applicant to come on board. So this is one of those times where you've got to be humble, you've got to be a little bit quiet, you've got to just throw the open-ended questions out there that you want to ask, then step back and allow those people to do the majority of the talking. Body language, you know, this can tell a lot about an applicant. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on here. I think most people are smart enough that you can look at this and go, I get it. If I'm hiring somebody who should be in the, in the let's say, the front of the house and they're going to be around other humans and they got their arms folded and they can't make eye contact with me and they can't smile, probably not going to make it to the next level. Or at the very least, they're not going to make it in the front of the house. We've got to find somewhere else if you think maybe they can you know, have a seat on the bus somewhere. Body language is important. I'm just not going to spend a ton of time on it. But you're obviously going to be watching that during the information gathering. This one, though, is key. You've got to stick to the interview guide. Now, there are a lot of questions that are going to be on this interview guide. I, I would maybe say don't feel like you have to ask all of the questions, especially if maybe in your head you're leaning toward not hiring them. However, I would design your questions on that guide in a very logical order. You know, one question, two questions, three questions, and this is the, the type of question that you might want to ask that is going to tell you the most about the applicant and, and will allow them to do the most talking versus maybe some of the easy softball questions that you might put near the, the, the back end. Don't, don't waste your time on those if you're starting to lean toward, eh, I'm probably not going to hire this person. I would say that this is also the opportunity that you can address any of those red flags that jumped off the application. Um, might be kind of hard to tell on the screen, but if you look at the sample here, I've left a couple blanks in there. Um, this is where you would put in those those questions that would be specific to you or if something was a red flag on the application. You're going to have the application there, but it just makes it easier if you want to pre-populate that into the interview guide itself. So again, don't feel like you got to ask all of them, but when you start designing these things, make sure that you're in a very logical order, um, You know, at least from a priority standpoint. These type of questions, I'm just going to throw a couple of these up there. I mean, I would assume that most of you have seen these before. These are very fundamental for most of you. Um, you know, you can read these on your own. Tell me about your last job. If I were to call your last boss, what would he or she say about you? Tell me about a time when you delivered personalized experience. Y yes, 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 and yes. Definitely do these. Do these up front. These are probably the key, you know, three or four right on the, the application or on the interview guide, rather. But, but I will caution you with this. People that do a lot of interviews, they're used to these questions. So just be prepared. You know, th these are, like I said, fundamental. Most people have heard them before. They're going to be prepared for these. I, I drew a line here because I wanted to share some of these others that might be cultural to you. Now, some of these are, are from my background. You know, if you're in a music-oriented business, it would be cool to ask this question. You know, who's your favorite musician and why? You know, what's the last concert that you attended? You know, that those are pretty relevant to like a house of blues or, you know, a hard rock cafe. You know, pick, pick something that would be relevant for your organization from a cultural standpoint. A couple others that I like, you know, that I think tell a lot about the applicant. You know, what other brand properties have you been to, at least in, in our brand, in our company? Describe those experiences. You know, what advice could you give me to enhance this property's atmosphere? What inspired you to apply with us? These are all very good questions, particularly the, the number three and number four on there is all about, tell me about the, the experience that you've had with my company. So these are very, very good. I wouldn't be limited to that, um, but certainly these are probably the types of questions that would almost fill up your entire interview guide number one. I am going to throw out an interviewing resource to you. you know, th this is one resource that I would point out from my friend Eric Chester. Uh, he put out a... Um, a white paper. He calls it on here a special report. Um, it, it was focused on millennials, came out several years ago. Uh, look, look at some of the questions on here. If you could buy any skill, what would it be? What things do customers do that you find annoying? You know, what's the biggest error in judgment you've ever made? 
how do you respond when someone does something really stupid? I would assume you know this is probably a little bit more on the <laughs> internal employee side, or it could be for guests. What question were you afraid I would ask but didn't? You know, there, there's something like I want to say 58 questions in this white paper that um, Eric Chester put together. Um, there are certainly some kind of crazy ones. You know, what animal would you be and why? If you want to ask those, go for it. I, I just think you know you're gonna you're gonna spend a lot of time and energy, especially in a first time interview that you really don't need to. Maybe it's a little bit more appropriate in a second interview or the third interview. And again, this one was written when he was focusing on millennials. I know he's working on another one focused on work ethic and aptitude and attitude. Again, he's a little bit more of an expert and a specialist in this, um, at least when it comes to the, the, the workforce, the, the talent group that's out there, that pool of people that we're looking for, probably more on the millennial base side. So th these are good questions to add as well if you think that's something you want to go for. Whatever you do though, you have to avoid these questions. These are no doubt the type of questions that will get all of us in the hot water. Anybody that's had to deal at all uh, with, with understanding any type of litigation and from an HR standpoint, these questions, whether you think you can do it, at least in the United States, these are questions that have absolutely no bearing whatsoever on, on the fact that somebody can do the gig or not. So, so these are going to be considered discriminatory, specifically if you do not hire the person. And as you're looking over all of these, you might be thinking, ah, two-thirds of those I got, but a couple of these, what? You're not allowed to, be, uh, to ask these? Yeah, it has no bearing on the job at all. You know, who cares what kind of uh, vehicle somebody drives or if they drive at all? All we care about is can they get to the job on time and can they do the, the duties? These questions have no bearing on the position at all. So all those other questions, that's why you want to stick to those and, and put those into your interview guide. You want to avoid these at all costs or you're just going to get yourself into trouble. All right, so let's talk about this next area, information giving. You probably aren't going to spend a ton of time here, but this is all about what I call tell selling the company. You know, this is your chance to prop up the brand, you know, make the company look uh, really cool. How much detail do you really give out about the company when I'm asking you something like this? You know, you probably notice this is a high energy, high volume, you know, environment or restaurant. As you can imagine, we have extremely high standards. You would get to work around great people in a fun environment and have a lot of flexibility. Again, I, I don't know how much I'm actually telling you about the organization. I, I might not be telling you hardly anything at all, but I am giving you a little bit of a heads up that this is a very cool and positive uh, environment. You know, that's what I want lingering in your mind. Even if you're walking out there going, geez, I didn't get the job. But yeah, this is kind of a cool company. I haven't been there before. So remember, you're spending seven to ten minutes with every single interview. This is a part of it. You want to treat people with dignity regardless if they're going to go to the next level or not. And I mentioned earlier that the majority of the applicants are not going to get the job. So, so what are they going to be in the future? They're guests. You know, they're going to be people, hopefully, that are going to come back to the well. So hopefully they think very fondly of the brand based on how we treated them, even in the interview, even if they don't get hired. So in this case, my point is even if you've mentally decided not to hire this person, even if you decided that within the first minute or two, you still need to do a little bit of information giving. And it's all because these people are going to be future guests. So again, the majority of the time, information gathering, but when you get to this, do a little bit of the tell, sell the company. Now, if you like the person, if you say yes and you're the first interview or you're the second one and you're setting them up for the, the next one, then yeah, you can go into more detail. And again, don't feel like you have to ask all of these that are in quotation marks. I'm just giving people some examples of some things you could say. You can probably tell from the staff that we really promote individuality here if in fact you're a company that does foster individuality. How about this one? We have extremely competitive benefits for employees, and you can list some of those things off if you want to. You know, if you got hired, you would experience a detailed training process when you come on board. There's a tremendous developmental opportunity, you know, if you want to be a manager. So again, go into as much detail, even at the very end, oh, hey, we offer great discounts, blah, 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 blah. Pick and choose what you want. Um, you know, get used to saying the things that you think that would be very specific that would get someone excited, particularly to get them on the hook to set them up for the next interview. You decide what those are. Last area is obviously on the closing. Now, this is going to change depending on if you like the person or if you want to continue on in the process or if you're going to shut them down. So the, the closing, let's say, yep, you definitely like them, then you are immediately 
immediately going to set them up for the next interview because if you don't do that, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go next door and they're going to get a job and you have lost them forever. A couple quick things that you could say, hey, do you have a moment to meet with another manager? You know, if you've got another manager there, uh, some organizations, they set it up so that, uh, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday is interviewing day. Like you always know every single week that's when we're going to do it or whatever you've set up. Or you're just lucky enough to have another manager in the building. If you don't, this is another, you could, hey, can you come back tomorrow and meet with so-and-so? But if you don't ask them to stick around to meet with someone else, or have them come back tomorrow or two days from now or whatever to meet with someone. Like I said, if they're really good, if they're a rock star, they're not going to wait for you if they don't feel like they have any hope of getting the gig. They're going to go somewhere else. Definitely thank the applicant, but def, you know, whatever you do, don't commit to anything. One of the things I've seen that happens quite a bit, once you put in a multi-interview process, it's too easy for someone to say, geez, we've got this uh, – three, four interview process. I like you, but you got to go through the ringer here. You got to go talk to the GM, you know, don't give somebody hope. And then somebody else who maybe doesn't like them is going to pull the rug out from underneath them. An applicant doesn't need to know how many interviews they are. there are. You know, you are the deciding factor at that moment. A couple things you could say though, hey, I appreciate you coming in and spending some time with us. We'll see you tomorrow when you meet with so-and-so. Remember, you look at this slide. This is a yes, I like them. I'm not committing but I'm going to set them up for the next interview. Obviously, if no, you do not like them. You're, you're, you're going to go in a different direction, and it, it's probably they, they don't have any hope of getting to the next interview, whatever it is. You're going to go to what we call the turnoff statement. This statement that I'm going to share with you will literally save your hiring life. It is one of the greatest things we've ever done. It's not everybody's favorite. But if you get to the point that you can remember this, and I don't ask people to memorize anything, but when it comes to managers, this is one of those that I would get to a point that this would roll off your tongue, and this is how it goes. We are interviewing several applicants at this time. If you've not heard from us by Thursday, you know, or within 48 hours, you can assume that we have filled the position. Why would you say that? Why, why would you use those exact words? And in fact, I would any reason to the statement and, and the reason I would do that and, and say it exactly like this and don't get bollocked up and trying to add and be cute you know you can do it in a very easy non-threatening way hey you know we're interviewing several applicants at this time if you've not heard from me by Thursday then you can assume we filled the position you know it's very easy to say once you memorize and understand it but if you start adding reasons into it people are gonna look for reasons to make you hire them let me give an example what if you said, oh, the reason I can't hire you is because uh, you can only work Monday through Friday and we actually need people to work on the weekends? You know what a potential hire is going to say? Oh, no, 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 I can work weekends. I thought you wanted the, uh, the, the best schedule, the, my preferred schedule. I'm sorry we can't hire you because uh, you're asking for, for $18 an hour. We start at $12 an hour. Oh, no, I can do it for $12 an hour. Oops, you've backed yourself into a corner. They will look for reasons to make you hire them. You use these exact words, and that will prevent people from calling you or even addressing it. You, you might actually have somebody say, oh, so can I call you on Thursday? No. Like I said, we're going through a lot of applicants at this time. If you've not heard from us by Thursday, you can assume we filled the position. Boom, shuts them down. You do not have to give reasons why you're not going to hire them. This statement, I'm telling you, will, will save your life from a hiring standpoint and quite honestly, will help prevent some risk. It'll help you from discriminating in any way. Once people start putting in their own two cents worth and trying to make it cute, oops, they open mouth and insert foot and all of a sudden you're in trouble, which is another reason that makes me nervous when I have hourly paid or staff members who have not been trained and, and maybe they're not thinking so much about this when they don't have you know, really good authority in being able to discipline or make hiring decisions, it makes me nervous when you put people into this position because of the turnoff statement more than anything else. Now, if you aren't going to hire them, we still want you to take time with them. We, we still want you to thank the applicant, but obviously you're not committing to anything and you're just coming with a, thanks a lot for coming in and spending some time with us. Standing up, shaking hands, making them feel positive, but yeah, you you're definitely are not going to hire them at all. Couple final thoughts that I would put on here. You know, and this is sort of a reminder more than anything else. If you do not have standards in place right now, some non negotiable interviewing standards, put those in place. And the three that I put on here are going to be the, the ones that I shared with you. 
put in some interviewing collateral that everybody should use. I don't care how big the organization is. If it's system-wide and it's painful to go out there and roll that thing out, still go out there and do it. You're, you're going to wind up having much better hires. Establish multiple interview process with every potential hire and use a different guide for each one. Th those three things you bring to an interview, you start with the application, look at that thing in 30 seconds looking at red flags, bring the job description, and bring the interview guide, the one that's appropriate for the interview. I already said do a multiple interview process. I think in the restaurant industry, if you've got enough managers, three interview process works. Use separate interview guides with different questions. Chunk the thing down into these four elements. This will help you remember the different areas of the interview. Opening, information gathering, where you're going to spend the majority of the time. Information giving, do it regardless of if you're going to hire the person or not. And then a closing. And if you get really good at memorizing the turnoff statement, boy, this is going to save you. We're interviewing several applicants at this time. If you've not heard from us within two days, you can assume we have filled the position. I have one more thing I'm going to share with you. Out of all the stuff that I talked about, nothing, nothing, nothing will matter as much as this. The only way that you will ever get better at interviewing is to actually practice. You can talk all day long about the content that I just shared with you in the last 40 minutes or so, but we have got to get to the point that we can do a little bit of role play. You can do some practice, which nobody likes doing ever. They never like doing it, and there's never seemingly a great time to do it. But it is absolutely the best form of skill building to develop these technical managerial skills, like uh, coaching and counseling an employee. If you've never done that before, you don't want to practice on, on the humans when you actually have to coach an employee. You want to practice that in a role play. How about handling a, a service recovery or a guest complaint? Definitely interviewing is one of these. You will never get better. The, the, the managers, whoever's actually doing these, will never get better unless they actually role play. So for me, I know for a fact that, th that this could be done whether it's in a manager meeting or I'm saying in a, a very structured instructor-led course, whether it's part of your MIT program as a project. I've done this with many brands. Uh, you could put it as part of your, let's say, corporate university. I'm assuming many of you on the uh, webinar bring managers together and you teach skills like this. I, I wouldn't put it past me to spend an entire half a day on this. There's nothing more important than, than getting the sales and profits that you need, and that's going to be based off of the humans that you hire. The only way you're going to get to that is actually interview them. So it is better for us to practice among each other versus stumbling around with an applicant and then ultimately making a bad hire. Practice makes perfect. And so I would, I would encourage you to figure out a way. I don't know what this looks like, but you could every once in a while, maybe once a year, you know, six months down the road, do this in a manager meeting, have all the managers practice. You can easily, easily take three managers, break them up into groups. Somebody's the applicant, somebody is the manager, and somebody's the coach. And they're just making sure that you're hitting all the, uh, all the things that I'm talking about on here. And you go through the seven to ten minutes. Practice on interview guide number one. That's the most important. When you're finished with that and you talk about it and it's 20 minutes later, blow the whistle. Everybody rotate. Somebody else is the applicant. Somebody else gets to be the manager. If you never practice as a manager, you will never get better. I'm going to put my contact information up here. I know that uh, I, I was moving at some pretty quick speed, and uh, Tara can talk about this as well, but this, uh, this quick webinar was recorded, and you can go back and look at this if there's some things that I maybe went a little bit too quick for you. But I'm also going to open it up to uh, some questions, whether you want to do that in the chat area or the question area. Or like I said, even right now with all of my contact information, you can contact me directly uh, if there's a question that you might have. So Tara, um, I wasn't looking at the question of the chat area. Uh, are there something uh, something that jumps off the screen that you want to talk about? <clears throat> there are a few. Um, one of them is uh, <clears throat> one of them is how do you feel about using staff members, hourly employees, to do interviews? Yeah, so I, I think probably I, I talked about some of that. Um, I, I know a lot of people love using them in, let's say, a hiring committee. Um, for me, I get nervous, as I said, about staff members doing the interview. Here's what I do like. You could have somebody sitting in on the interview while a manager does it. They don't really say a lot. They don't ask the questions, but then after the applicant leaves, you can talk about it with this staff member and say, is this somebody that would, you know, that, that you would like to work with? Do they fit the culture? How do you feel about the interview itself? You know, having them involved, I think, is fantastic. I am not a fan, though, of having hiring committees 
and, and having four, five, six people lined up in front of somebody firing off questions, I think applicants are just too nervous anyway. You want to try and get people comfortable, relaxed, so that you can get to the root of who they actually are. You can determine if they're a rock star or or a lip syncer. You know, they're just they're going through the motions and just flapping their gums. So, uh, me personally, no to staff members, no to hiring committees. Uh, okay, there are several questions here, and they're they're in no particular order, so we might be jumping around a little bit. But the next okay. one is. Do you think gaps in employment are still a red flag with even with millennials? I have been hearing that gaps in employment are becoming more commonplace as a younger generation follows their passions. Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's totally up to the manager. If you don't think that's a big deal and that's a time saver, um, th then don't ask it. Me personally, I would want to ask it. I think it doesn't hurt to still throw it out there. Um, you know, and, and look for some of the reasons why somebody wasn't working for a year, two years. It might be that there weren't jobs available. Um, it might be that somebody was on maternity leave, they you know, joined the military service for a couple years, went back to school, focused on their education. There's a lot of good reasons. You'll still learn a lot about the applicant. So I'm a yes, I still ask the question, but I can totally see somebody's opinion. If they don't think it's relevant, hey, it's your time. There's no interviewing time police. You want to spend time on it or not, totally up to you. Okay, the next is, do you endorse using a scorecard to rate candidate answers? Would you would this be beneficial for consistency from manager to manager? Sure, I like that idea. I think if you're going to do it, you know, put it right into the interview guide. Um, I do think if you're going to get into the number rating system, just like I would always teach when it comes to performance appraisals, you better define what the numbers are. There needs to be a grid amongst the managers that says, this is what a three means in this area. Here's what my five means so that we're all on the same page. So I'm not opposed to that. I think it's a quick, easy scorecard that you can circle. People can ref reflect on that, but put it into the interview guide. I like it. Uh, the next is, uh, what do you think about pre-hire assessments? I like pre-hire assessments um, more for managers than I do staff members. I do realize um, some people will swear on them. I, I think a lot of these hiring tools, and I've seen them all, Corvertis, um, I, I think Myers-Briggs, some personality assessments, DISC, not, not just from a team building, but from a hiring standpoint, they're good as a tool. I think these organizations that are big enough, and I've worked and been around companies that have this as a part of their process, as part of the, um, like an online um, interviewing process that you have to do sort of this testing and assessment before they even get to the, the actual interview. I, I do get nervous about that, that we don't have humans using their own smarts, their own wits, and looking at somebody in the eye and asking very specific questions that maybe you haven't thought about in the in the personality or the assessment in general. I think if you use it as a tool, as one of the many tools, yes, definitely do it. If you're using it as the tool, I'm not a fan. I think we've gone too far in looking at the electronic process and tool and not enough about looking into somebody's soul and seeing if they fit my value orientation or not. Uh, okay, the next one is, what are your thoughts on checking references on hourly applicants? Good question. Um, I say still do them. Just expect you're not going to get a lot of answers. Most companies, you know, if you went back 20, 25 years ago, we were in a different place where people were saying very specific things. You could even read between the lines. Um, you know, even if somebody said, I have nothing to say about Jim Knight, you know, maybe that tells you a lot about the person. Um, most people are going to tell you, yes, they worked here. Yes, that's the, the date or the time that they were here. They're not going to give you anything else. But you never know. I, I would still ask you know, for references, and I would still do it if you've got the time to do it. Again, it's totally up to the manager. If you think you can do this on your own and, and you don't feel like you need to have somebody else's opinion from somewhere else they worked, um, go for it. Me, I'm, I'm doing references. Uh, okay. Um, one person had said uh, – Hmm. Did I just did I just read that one already? I'm um, sorry. Uh, one person is asking about um, the Eric Chester's white paper. I'm wondering if that is available somewhere. They can't seem to find it online. Do you have a link to that somewhere? Um, yes, I'm trying to think where um, his stuff. I think is housed in uh, WorkEthic.com. You know what? I'm not 100 percent sure. I would go to just Eric Chester on Google. Okay. Or Bing or whatever search engine, because he's he has two or three different companies, and I think they all lead to the same place. And he changes it based off of the book that he wrote last. So his last one's a little bit focused on um, millennials and work ethic. That's sort of been his thing, but I think he's been uh, coming off of that because obviously we've got millennials working in, in the workspace. We're now talking about the digital natives. 
you know, is sort of that next generation Z or iGen, whatever it's called. So I'm sorry I don't know the link, but I would just I would just Google his name and uh, you'll you'll find some stuff there. Okay. Can, uh, next one is: Can you explain why we all we always feel that the last person to interview a candidate should be the top boss? What are the pros and cons of that? I'm not sure I understand the question. You're saying the last per the last manager who did the uh, the interview. I think yeah, the last person in the series of people that you're going to have interview should be the highest level person. I disagree. I think the last person on the interview should be the highest level because if we, let's say you make the general manager the very first interview or even the second, and if I like them, then I have probably influenced the rest of the manager. So you know, some other manager, even if it's a department manager, in a lot of ways they're going to think, oh. Well, the boss liked them. You know, I, I should probably like them as well. I think it's going to skew that. You definitely want the GM or or HR in a hotel environment to be involved, but they're the last ones. They're putting their fingerprints on it. Everybody's now in agreement. But I would not make the last person. Um, I, I would not make the, the the person who did the interview before you a higher level than you if you can help it. Try and put it in a very specific priority so that people aren't influenced from the person before, other than just pure data, pure facts that are on the interview guide. Okay. Would you do anything different if you were conducting an interview over the phone uh, versus in person? No, I would not. I, you know, there, there's some people that will um, – I've seen some really good uh, behavioral – based interviewing where somebody might put them in a situation, hey, sell me this bottle of ketchup, you know, here's a t-shirt, can you sell this to me? If you could do something physical like that or or they put them in some sort of a situation where you can physically see them, that's obviously better if you were in front of them. It's hard to do that over the phone, but no, I would not change anything. The exact same questions that I would be asking, especially if I had an interview guide, I've got the application, the job description, I would do it exactly the same if it was over the phone or if it was on uh, Skype or Google Hangout or any other format. No changes for me. Okay, the next one is what if an applicant asks, how did I do, and you know you're not going to hire them? What would you say? You, you know, I, I think, again, you're going to put yourself into hot water. I mean, I get that somebody would say, you know, maybe enlist that. I don't hear that very often, but if you do have an applicant that says, how did I do, I'd say, you know what, we're, we're going through a lot of applicants at this time. You know, we're going to hire the, the best person for the job. If you haven't heard from me by Thursday, you know, you can assume that, that we fill the position. I know it sounds so sterile and, and technical in nature, but once you try and put something in there like, oh, you did great or oh, there's some things you need to work on, you're, you're going to get yourself into trouble and you're going to say things you really don't want to say. You don't need to say it. You don't have to say it. I, I, I find I think that's probably the exception to the rule. I'm not sure I've had anybody ever do that before, but if you've had that, um, I, I would stick as close as you can in your own language, your own vernacular, stick to the turnoff statement. Okay, the next one is a little bit longer. It's, is there a value in asking behavioral questions in each interview round that are very similar but not the same? For example, tell me about a guest that you couldn't please no matter what, and then in another round interview say, uh, tell me about a time when you thought your actions would please a guest but instead they weren't happy with your performance and left disappointed. Sure, I like that, but here's the key. I think when you get these three interview guides or whatever number you're going to do, you want to do four, you want to do two, it's up to you. The, the you know Three seems to be a great number and fits in the restaurant and hotel industry. I would just make sure that all of the managers are all collectively aware of what are the questions on all of the, the interview guides. So if you want to completely separate them and do one of those questions different so that you're not getting a answer that's a, almost a synonymous answer, um, then go and change it. If you want them to be somewhat similar and you're okay with that and you think it's critical in, in interview guide number two, go for it. I would just say get with human resources, get with the GM, however large your, your organization is, figure out what the right questions are, and then everybody everybody agrees to it. We put our hands over the heart and say we're going to ask these questions. Uh, the, the, the long answer to that is sure, yeah, if you want to do that, that's up to you. I would try and ask different questions to get different perspectives. Um, okay, there, I've got two different questions that are close but different. One is, is what are your thoughts on panel interviews where you bring in several applicants and HR and hiring managers to, to interview a candidate? And the other is, what do you uh, think about hiring committees comprised of several people at one time doing an interview? Yeah, I think I answered that early up front. I'm, I'm not a fan of it for a variety of reasons. I think it makes the applicant too nervous. I think if you bring people in, a lot of people – um, you know, other than the fact that you still have a manager maybe asking the questions, and you have other people that are there just sort of gauging the type of answers that come out, and you want to 
talk about the applicant after they're gone. I wouldn't mind if a key staff member were in the room. But hiring committees, I'm not a fan of it. Some people will swear by it, um, you, you know. And again, if if that works for you, then then probably you're further along in the uh, in the interviewing process. A lot of companies are not looking to um, amp up their organization if they're already at that point. Me, I'm not a fan of of hiring committees at all. Okay, and I have one last question, um, which is, how do you realign someone to a different position than the one they applied to? So that would be one of those, once you make it through, it's probably, um, you know, either it's in the, the GM part or it's when you're starting to offer them the job. And it might be if this is one of those rare occasions where you do need experience, although that's not that critical, I think, in our industry, um, I think you have that conversation. And it could be, you know, we like you, we want to bring you on board, we're going to start you in this position. Um, the, the one that you're looking for is a little bit more advanced. We're not there yet. I'd rather it be a progression, whether it's a tipped employee or you need a little bit more financial background. Uh, you know, in this business, we want you to spend a year understanding our culture first, blah, 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 whatever it is. I think it's very easy to put in there. For instance, if somebody's coming in for a bartender, most, most of the restaurants that I know of do not traditionally want to go out and hire a bartender from the outside on their own. They'd rather internally groom them. Whether they started as a host or maybe they were a busser at one time, they become a server and they ultimately get to, even if you think that's the coveted position, and I'm just using that as an example, you know, do it internally grooming them versus hiring in the outside. If you don't have anybody ready, then you've got to go to the outside, unfortunately, if you need a stellar rock star bartender. But that might be one of those cases where somebody has done this before, they think they can come in and start slinging drinks and they're going to be awesome, but really what they need to do is understand the company, the organization, our values, how everybody fits, and you know, after they work through a summer or after they're here a year or whatever, they can move to that position. So I, I think you can talk about that internally again as managers, figure out what's the right thing to say, and then stick to your guns. If, if somebody comes on board and we like them, but they're not for this position, what do we do? What do we say to them? And I think there's some easy, quick little course corrections you can make. Uh, okay, I think we're just up, up coming up to an hour, so I think we'll finish there. Jim, thank you so much for doing this for, for us. Um, everyone else who's online, with, this will be available online on our website um, if you'd like to, to come back and look at it again or if you need to share it with anyone. Awesome. Thank you so much. Those are a lot of questions. Hopefully I, uh, I answered a lot for, uh, for people. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Bye. My pleasure.